Welcome, everybody. This is the last session of SUNY Law 2021. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this session is a Save Scribbler Online, developing a library escape room uh, for Zoom, presented by Johanna McKay, instructional design librarian, and John Cosgrove, resource management, outreach, and humanities librarian at Skidmore College. Um, I'm Jocelyn Ireland. I'm from MVCC. I'll be your moderator today. Uh, the session is being recorded. Um, if the presenters have slides, those will be shared along with the recording. Um, and we welcome you to enter questions in the chat. But without further ado, I'll hand it over to our speakers. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. I really I was like 3.30 on a Friday. I don't I don't know how many people are showing up for this. So I'm really pleasantly surprised that everyone decided to come out today and talk about escape rooms. Um, and I hope everyone's conference has been going really, really well. John, yeah. any words? Thanks. No, thanks so much for coming. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, have a fun and informative end to soon. All right. So let's get started. Let me pull up. Uh, my PowerPoint here. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about something that John and I have been working on over the last um, about three or four years now, and it's a game we call Save Scribbler. Scribbler in the picture here is our uh, intrepid library squirrel, and if you're wondering why we have like a squirrel theme to our game, if you're ever on uh, the Skidmore campus, we have a lot of squirrels. They are very fat, they are very healthy, and they pop out of garbage cans at you. So we went with a squirrel theme because we thought it was kind of a nod to Skidmore and a nice neutral theme. So that is who Scribbler is in the picture. And in the first couple of iterations that we did, we designed this as an in-person escape room or a breakout room as we call it. And then when COVID hit, we had the challenge of most of the classes being online and a lot of restrictions related to, you know, social distancing and wearing masks. So in the past year, we had to move Safe Scribbler to an online platform, in this case, Zoom. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. But when it comes to breakout rooms and escape rooms, when we were designing these, Honestly, what worked the best was to actually play them. And I went to a lot of conferences when we started. So a big component of today is gonna to be interactive because you're gonna to get to pay, uh, play a kind of shortened version of Save Scribbler. So you get a sense of what the gameplay is like, what are the clues like, you'll decide what you like that we did, what, what you don't like that we did. And it'll get you thinking about how you might be able to, to adapt this uh, type of game for your own institution. But for the agenda today, I'm just gonna briefly talk about just kind of how we came up with the game and why we did it. Then we'll spend about a third of the session in breakout rooms actually playing the game and hopefully saving a squirrel. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how we went from an in-person game to an online one because of COVID and then just general steps that John and I take when we're designing our escape rooms. And John's gonna be monitoring the chat. So feel free to ask questions. Uh, he might pepper in as well as we go. All right. So a little bit about Skidmore College. We're a small liberal arts in upstate New York. We're about 2,500 undergraduate students. And Lucy Scribner Library is the only main campus library uh, on the campus. So it's a single library. And like many of your institutions, we have something that's called the Scribner Seminar. So this is a first year course that all of our first year students have to take in their fall semester. It's four credits. The fourth credit is usually run by a peer mentor, so either a sophomore, junior, or senior who's working with the instructor. Um, and usually that fourth credit hour might be educational stuff, might be social stuff. It's one of those courses that are designed to kind of get students into campus life and kind of um, have, it sometimes has a research component, sometimes doesn't. Uh, and it's not mandatory, but a lot of the instructors who will do a Scribner seminar often include a library component. So some type of library session. And Scribner seminars are really interesting because they can be very research-based and they may also not be. So what we were seeing is that some classes would come in, they would have a research project and we would be able to do a very straightforward one-shot, you know, traditional one-shot session with a catalog or a database or anything like that. Um, but then we would also get instructors who wanted just us to show them you know, the catalog and databases, but they didn't have any research. And it was almost like a tour of the library or just kind of a general orientation. So the dilemma we had was when we get these general library orientations, how do we make them more engaging? The students would be really polite. 
they would pay attention, you know, they would, we would get them on the catalog and they would do some searches. But in reality, they weren't really engaged because there was no impetus for them to be engaged. They didn't have a project they were working on. Um, so the solution after going to a bunch of conferences was to do an escape room, or in this case, what we also sometimes call a breakout room. So I had attended a couple conferences where different institutions had used the breakout, what's called a breakout kit. Um, and it's breakout.edu, where they would, you hide something in a box and you lock it, and then students have to solve clues to get kind of the thing out of the box of some kind. And usually either using library resources or some other resources. So about four years ago, we got one of these kits and we use that as the starting point, essentially to kind of think about how we would design an, an escape room or a breakout room um, and what we would do. And that's kind of how we came up with Save Scribbler. We used it as kind of a starting point. So we can go into, I mean, I could give you some presentation slides on what Scribbler looks like and kind of how it works, but it is way more fun if we force you to play. So haha. -ha. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna treat you kind of like we would our students and we're gonna play Save Scribbler and kind of go through the steps. Um, and then we'll talk more about in detail after you've done, you're done playing with it, kind of what we're going through. John, any questions in the chat as I've been going? The thing I should know about. No, nope. uh, Jocelyn appreciated the fact that the peer mentors are involved with the, uh, the seminars, but no questions yet. Okay, so in the chat, I'm going to put a link here. And this is going to be to our mission report. So the version of Save Scribbler that we're going to be playing today is called Save Scribbler Squirrels in Space. Every year we pick kind of a different theme. It's always squirrels, but we always pick a different theme. So the first thing that's in the chat is going to be the mission report. This is going to tell us what the scenario is for today's game, what we're playing. Now, normally, if we were doing this in person with or if we were doing this with students, we would spend the first five or 10 minutes giving them a very brief orientation to the library. So how to, how to use our catalog, um, some quick library facts. Uh, because everyone here today is information professionals, we're gonna skip that and just hope you guys can use our catalog and we'll see what happens. Uh, I'm gonna share the screen just to go through this with you. So here's our mission report. So step one, we're gonna talk about what has happened and what are we trying to do today in Save Scribbler? So I'm gonna scroll down and you can have yours open or you can leave it closed because um, I'm gonna read it out loud, but we're gonna head to the first page. So I'm gonna read our game scenario for today. So this is Acorn One Mission, Save a Nibbler's Mission. It has been rumored that underneath the new CIS building and the CIS building is our sciences, our STEM building essentially. So. Underneath the new CIS building, Skidmore has invested in a secret woodland agency whose sole purpose is to send squirrels into space to explore the unknown regions of our galaxy and universe. This agency called NUTSA, National Universe Traversing Squirrel Agency, has completed several successful missions and is now looking to its most ambitious yet, sending a squirrel to Jupiter. The agency is overseen by Scribbler Squirrel, the library's renowned rodent researcher. Nibbler, Scribbler's sister and brave astronaut, is about to take off on the first mission to Jupiter. However, Scribbler, who also oversees launch command and acts as mission support, decided he needed a snack from one of the supply boxes to keep him focused. While reaching for some tang and freeze-dried ice cream, Scribbler fell into the box and got locked inside. He was holding onto the launch codes when he fell and they're locked in with him. Scribbler's mouth is too full of ice cream for him to shout, Luckily, he's left clues in his book nest that lead to items in the library that will supply parts of the five character launch sequence. Find all the items, unscramble the code, and start the launch sequence. Save Nibbler's mission to Jupiter. All right, so our job today, you're gonna to be broken up into small teams and breakout rooms, and your team is going to try to solve some clues, and I'll put that in a second, we'll see those, um, to try to find a five character launch sequence and get Nibbler to Jupiter. I'm gonna scroll a little bit farther down in the mission report. And again, feel free to just look at the screen and talk about the, the game rules. So they mentioned everyone's gonna be in a small team in a breakout room, about four or five people. And your job as a team is to work together to try to solve as many clues as possible. We're in an abbreviated version today. We're only doing 30 minutes, so no pressure. Like just try to solve whatever you can. 
One important thing is the mission report that I just gave you doesn't have any clues. So once we start the game, you can, uh, you can just get rid of this mission report. You don't need it unless you want to just peruse it at your leisure for fun. But there's no mission, there's no clues or anything in this mission report. However, you do need one thing, which is our launch site. So I am going to, in the chat, put the link to the NUTSA launch site. So that should be a lib guide that will lead you to this launch site. And this is critical for the game today. So everything you need to play the game when you're in your team is going to be on this launch site. So in the middle here, we've got the resources that you're going to want to use. So the catalog is going to be crucial. You're going to want to go in there and, and John's going to give you a demo clue in just a second to kind of show you what you're looking for. But you'll definitely need our catalog throughout the entire game. For today, normally one of the clues relies on a database and, and the one we picked is ProQuest Research Library. Just from a logistics standpoint, we can't get people permission to use it because of the password. So when you get to a clue that might requ require an article, if you have ProQuest Research Library through your own institution, it'll work. If you don't, you can skip that clue. You can try Google Scholar, it actually might work in that one. Um, but just be aware if you click on this link for ProQuest Research Library, you're going to hit a pay, you're going to hit a login wall. So sorry about that. But the catalog should work for everyone today. So the NUTSA website also features all the clues that you have to solve. So on the right hand side, you'll see that these images and stuff on the right, each one of these is a separate clue. You can actually use whatever you need to solve a clue. You can use Google, you can use an app. We have had students phone their parents. I'm not kidding, that's actually happened and I think it worked out nicely for them. So whatever you wanna to do to solve a clue, when you click on it, it'll open up, do it. The main thing you need to know though is that the very last step, you will end up in the catalog looking for either a physical book or a physical DVD in our library. And in the record of that item, you'll see part of the launch code sequence. And again, John will walk you through it in a second. Um, so just remember your clues are all on the right, that's what you need to solve. Your tools are in the middle and here is your launch sequence. So if you, do, if you are really speedy and you get the whole launch sequence, you can try to type it in. What we'll do is at the end, when we all come back to the, as a group, we'll actually see what people found and we might be able to piece together the launch sequence just using what each group did. All right, Let's see if I forgot anything. Um, lastly, when you guys are in your groups, you can raise your hand at any point to call for help. And John and I will come in. Any library related questions are freebies. You can ask as many as you want. So if you're having issues with our catalog or you have just general questions, you can. You also will all get one scribbler hint. So at any point, if you're working on a clue and you need help with it, you can call one of us in and we will give you a hint on that clue. And I think that's it for the games. So just make sure I'll put it in the chat one more time that you have the link to the NUTSA website. And John, would you like to give a demo clue for them? Yeah, do you happen to have the, the actual clue? I do. I can put it up. Actually, let me share my screen and I'll show it. Yeah, that'd be great. Here you go. So this is an example of uh, one of the of, of a very simple clue, uh, which will show the mechanics of what will happen in the catalog in terms of finding the, uh, the different parts of the, the launch code. Um, does anyone recognize this image? Does this mean anything to anybody? Feel free to just speak up or raise your hand. Yeah, it's the magic school bus. The magic school bus so that that gives us an, a, something to search in the catalog for so uh johanna maybe i can go for it i'll see if i can pull my, that up now let's see we'll go off the launch uh site we can go to the catalog and we're gonna put in magic school bus And then I might say to the to the students, you know, can we use another search term? And we might say, well, we're going to use space. So from ten results, we might go down to once I type it properly, two results. 
And so the obvious new, obvious one here in terms of our theme is Magic School Bus Lost in the Solar System. And what you'll see under the local notes here is that in this case, the part of the launch code would be the letter Z. Um, and usually I will, we'll, we'll go on a little bit about local notes and I'll show this, make some examples of local notes and special collections. I won't bother with that right now. But in terms of finding launch code, you're always gonna find a launch code piece in the catalog and always under a local note. So one good way to know whether you've got the right thing or not is to just see if there's a local note. And if there isn't, then it's, you're on, you're, you might be close, but you're on the wrong trail. Any questions about how to find the pieces of the code in the catalog? Johanna, did you mention ProQuest? I, I did, I did for that okay, particular good. one. Yep. Yeah, any questions about what's about to happen <laughs> in terms of where you're going, what you're doing? I should mention too on the Nutsa website, those clues you can do in any order. We just, so if you're if you're working on one and it doesn't work or you're having trouble, skip it and move on. Um, feel free to just bounce around. Um, I'm gonna encourage everyone when you actually get into your breakout room, if you feel comfortable, uh, turn on your video so that you can see your team members, feel free to unmute yourself so you can chat through it. I'm gonna change the sharing screen settings as well so that when you're in your breakout room, you can actually share your screen and work with one another. Um, so I think we're ready to roll unless there's any other questions. You know, one thing that we noticed when we went from, from in-person to online, in-person, we could just overhear the students if they were struggling. So we would just stop over to their groups and to, to approximate that, we just started jumping into the, into the breakout sessions and saying, how's it going? So we might do a little bit of that as we go along. So you may see us occasionally popping in and out just to check on your status and, and make sure everyone's doing okay. But Jocelyn, I think we're ready for the breakout rooms if you're ready. Okay, sounds good. Jocelyn, do you want me to pause the recording too, since it's just going to be us for like 30 minutes? Well, um, Bill's going to be editing the recording, so I don't think there's a need. He can edit this dead air time out. Oh, very well. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. I was looking for the, the sample image while you were talking. So I, I didn't hear you say ProQuest and I just wanted to make sure that we had mentioned it to them. Oh, no, no, thanks for the reminder, that helps. We lost people once we said interactive. We're like, I'm jumping ship. That always happens. That's I've right. got a- Fewer That's breakout a rooms to deal with. Yeah, right. I was going to do four. I was like, I better do three. No, thank you for that. Yeah, that. I think I was at a meeting once where it was like 200 people, and they're like, we're now going to do breakout rooms. And you just saw the participant level like plummet. <laughs> people are like, I'm out. <laughs> and John, I think I can see, I can see the breakout rooms and I can join them actually. Do you have that same function? Uh, where would I do that? Do you have breakout rooms on the bottom? I do. Oh, I, see, I never had this power while we were, uh, when we were doing the, uh, Jocelyn discovered it. I don't know. I don't know how you did it, but that's kind of cool. Yeah. This is my first time actually having an automatic timer. 
<laughs> we had set everything up ahead of time, so we didn't want to mess around with it once once we started going in the semester. And we had just set it up with Johanna leading, so we just left it that way. All right, so do we want to pop in at the 20 minute mark if they haven't called us in yet? Yeah, we'll give them, give them some time to, to kind of mull a little bit before we pop in. It's time for me to continue my tradition of desperately wanting to help people early on, early on while you while you stay back. Right. As we have, it's not quite good cop, bad cop. It's more like tough love and wanting to help. I was the one who liked to have a big clock going while we did when we did it in person, so that the pressure of the time would be going the whole time. I make it five minutes and I'm like, they need our help. We have to get in there. They may be confused. Oh no. <laughs> Jocelyn, has your SUNY law been going Pretty well. Have you been room moderator for the whole time for a lot of the different rooms? For just uh, room one, I have been for the for the whole conference. Oh wow, that's a lot. Wow. Um, last year I was the conference chair though, so this year I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is so less, much less stressful. <laughs> so I, I've been enjoying it. Last year must have been a nightmare trying to throw something together. Yeah, it was, but. <laughs> I was happy with how it turned out. I'm record attendance and um, yeah, it turned out as well as it could have. Did you find this year you got even more people than traditionally um, attend in, in an in-person version? Yes, definitely. Usually for an in-person, we have about 200. This year we had um, just over 400. And oh, wow. Nice. Had over 500. So. Wow. Yeah. But um, this year seems like less people have actually come the day of. So that was kind of interesting. Last year, there was probably about like 300 that actually showed up the day of. And this year is definitely a little less. Of a percent. Mm -hmm. Well, the we the, the state was literally opening up as the week went on, right? That may have had some impact on it. <laughs> Whereas last year, it was probably the opposite. It was getting more and more closed. As the week went on. I hadn't thought about that. That's a good point. But nowhere else to go. <laughs> yeah, it's tricky too when it's free or $10 because then it's like, you don't have, you know, you don't have the commitment as much to, to feel like you have to go to every presentation or, you know, you're like, oh, I'll just go Wednesday and skip the other two days or vice versa. Yeah, there's a tricky balance there with making it what they call it too cheap and people don't, don't care anymore if they lose their 10 or whatever it is. Well, I went to, I had a couple good conference or presentations, so that was good. I've been bopping around. I now want to start a seed library, so get ready. <laughs> well, if you take seeds, do you have to return a plant? No, but you can donate the seeds, apparently. I don't know. This It, it was one of those, I was like, well, this is too complicated, but I might take a small piece of it and just give seeds away or something like that because there was there was a theory that people would then grow the the plants and then bring the seeds back so that you could have like a perpetual seed library which is a wonderful idea but i was like that's too much that's too much work so i may just give seeds to students and hope they plant them or something i don't know i'll let it mull in my brain yeah my when's arbor, what's, what, what, uh, arbor day is the only day i can think of off the top of my head but I, don't, I doubt you were thinking of trees.
I suspect some of the comments in the chat were from the people who, who stuck around because there were some comments about people being amused by the whole thing, which is good because that's the whole purpose. All right, we've got one minute and 40 seconds and then I'm going in there. Can't take it. I gotta, I gotta help. Except there's a bunch of librarians. So I'm gonna go in there like, we're fine. You can leave. All right, so where are you going? And I'll pick another one and then. I can go to room one. Why don't you go to room two? And then uh, I can see who's in what room. So whoever is finished first can go, can go to room three after. Okay, and, and we have the ability to jump back out we're going to hope so. I think so. I think we should be able to. Because I think we can. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jocelyn. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I select an option where participants could choose a room and you can always leave and come back to this main room. So but we'll see. <laughs> see a message from me like, help me, get me out. <laughs> So in the end, we had, was it four, eight, 13, 13 intrepid participants who were willing to do a breakout room on a Friday afternoon. That's pretty Which good. is almost like having a Scribner seminar. The number is almost identical. I think the original registration was like 100. So I was like, yeah, that's about right. That, was, that would have been insane. <laughs> I, was, I was scared. <laughs> I didn't even know if Zoom could do that many breakout rooms. I didn't know if there was a cap on the breakout rooms. I don't know. Our institution had a like a, a huge event and I think they did like 50 breakout rooms and it was like, there was a huge delay. And so we're like, is it working? It's not working. It's not, they're not open. What do we do? Oh. <laughs> it's awkward. What do we do? It's like, I think it's, I think it just needs some time. All right, coach, I'm going in. I'm going to room one. I'll see All you right, there. so you're going to one and I'll jump in on two. I'll, yeah. Here they come. Oh no. Hello, welcome back intrep intrepid scribbler people. Hooray. You guys were doing great. You guys are like killing it on the on the clues there. All right, so now what we're gonna do as, as a group, we are gonna see if we can get this squirrel into space. So uh, I don't know if all team members, write in what characters that you have, that you did find as you were solving the clues. And we'll see if we can figure out what the word is or thing is that we've got to put in. We've got J-O-E, O-V-1-E. So we've got O-V-1. And one of the groups found a J. So we have all five characters. We just have to figure out what order they go in. But Joe one. Going to give it a shot. Let's see. Hold on. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three. Two, one, zero, zero, zero. Yay, nice job, everyone. We did it. The squirrels in space. <laughs> I feel like the, I, I guess, the typical student who would be part of the group, but um, wouldn't actually be following all the steps, you know, that would get to to the final result. So, um, so, so you know, I didn't. <clears throat> I I feel less than less than satisfied <laughs> with how I did, and and with my kind of my understanding. I think. Yeah, it's a little tricky. I mean, we we also skipped out like. The, the beginning part where we actually go through it a little bit more with the students and kind of go through the catalog and stuff. 
Um, but there is that element of confusion. This would not be, I think one of the things that we definitely emphasize is that this is a nice general fun orientation, but even when we, we market it to the faculty, it's not a replacement if they've got a research project and they have to do like a, like a, cause that's not going to help them if they have to like find articles or anything like that. So the goal we kind of have is to just give them a nice intro to the catalog and get them using it a little bit. Um, and just also interacting because it's that first year experience to get a little bit more interaction with their fellow students. Right. But you are totally right about the confusion factor. It's, um, there is that with that element of the game. Definitely. And in the, in the physical version, it's as much of a scavenger hunt and an introduction, a stealthy introduction to the building as anything else, because they have to physically go and get the stuff. So one of the things we emphasize, especially since not everybody is as good at, feels comfortable doing the, the problem solving and that kind of stuff, is for everybody to get a chance to get up and get out of the room so that they're getting up to the different floors of, of right. the library. The other thing that we didn't plan on when we started these was how competitive the groups get amongst themselves, even though in, in principle, they're supposed to do it all. You know, they can do it as a larger group. That's not the way it works at all. They usually uh, just sort of get very competitive. And some, some of the faculty actually encourage that. So you mean like each little, each little cohort? Yeah. Would, would be competing against the other cohorts. Right. right. It depends right. on the group actually, because sometimes we get faculty and they do start competing. And then there's other times when like halfway through students are like, what do you have over there? And they start chatting with each other mm -hmm. and solving it. So we tend to let the class dictate whether they decide to compete or not. It's a little weirder when we had the online version because normally in the in-person version, just to give you an idea of what that's like, they're in small groups, but they're in the same room. So right. they can chat with the other groups. They can see what they're doing. The other big difference with the in-person is when one group goes off and finds an item, when they come back, they'll let the whole class know what they solved and what they found so that other people stop working on that clue and they'll work on a different clue instead. Right. right. We so literally we have, have a bell on the table and they, they bang the bell and then make an announcement. And it's amazing how uh, how certain things that you would never expect to be uh, important to people are important, like hitting that bell is like a big thing for a lot of people. <laughs> Did you, do you have any um, classes that are like focused around, I don't know, um, humanities students or versus uh, uh, science or, you know, pre-med oriented? I was just wondering if you had different levels of competitiveness in different I know, so the way the Scribner seminars are set up is they usually go with the theme and that's usually different disciplines. Mm -hmm. So I know in particular, the, the one that like one of the business faculty does makes it competitive. She's like there, and I think some of the sciences, they make it more competitive where you're right. I think some of the arts and humanities are like, we're all together, we're, we're one. I don't know, it, it depends on the faculty a lot of the times. We're gonna go into kind of the differences between the in-person and the online and also talk about how we design this. But I, if we have time, if anybody has one or two specific questions about like what just happened, <laughs> feel, feel free to put them in the chat or just unmute yourself. We're a smaller group. I think this is really fun. Oh, thanks. Um, I think this is really fun. And I was just wondering what you, what you think um, the, um, the experience is between in-person and online. Did you like the online better? Do you, or did you like the in-person better? Or did the kids like it better? We, I, I, well, I'm gonna speak for John, but feel free to disagree, John. Uh, I, we definitely love the, the in-person better than the online because you have that element where they're literally running around the library huh? um, and it gets them that call number training as well. Um, the benefit with the Zoom, so you guys did great. I mean, your, your groups were solving three to five clues. Um, typically in the Zoom, um, most groups solve maybe two or three clues, but that's actually more than the in-person because with the in-person, they spend a lot of time like physically getting to the book. So like you waste about 10 or 15 minutes because they go off on a hunt and okay. then they come back. Um, so there's pros and cons, but I think we, John, do you like the in-person better? way better 
it's e much easier to massage the groups to overcome some of the things that Holly was saying about frustrating because you can tell by body language and uh, how the group is doing in terms of how many clues they're getting. And you can just start helping them in ways that they're not even realizing they're being helped because you can overhear it. And in the Zoom environment, of course, you have to actively push yourself into the into that group to do it. Whereas yeah. in person, you can just sort of casually help people along in ways that they may not even realize they're being helped. I have a question about the, in the physical space, did you ever have issues uh, with, with, you know, items that all the groups need to get to being misplaced or, or you know, not reshelved correctly, that kind of thing? We've been pretty lucky because um, usually what happens is we'll reshell them ourselves. We did come up, one of the things we, we were worried about is what happens if somebody actually checks out the book that we need for Scribbler. So what we would do is we will buy double copies of everything and we, we keep one copy for ourselves so that we can put it out when we play the Scribbler game. Um, the other thing that's a little bit different depends on the iteration, but like in the in-person, a lot of times we use what's a color lock. So it's a, it's a color wheel with five different colors. And instead of hiding like a physical key, we hide just paper bookmarks with the colors that they need. And that way, if something goes missing, we can just print it out and replace it really quickly. Um, but I don't think we've ever lost, our students are pretty good. We've never had like clues taken or misplaced or anything. We used to put nutter butters in the first iteration as a red herring. And they got eaten a lot, so we had to buy a lot of boxes and nutter butters. But other than that, I think that was the only issue. And there is a lot of inventorying everything after every session and setting it up. up. So, um, yeah, in some cases, the, the, the physical clues that we would usually use, like a, like a box, like a file box. And sometimes they would just crumple up something they didn't realize that it was going to be used again. And we'd have to print out new copies and stuff like that. But that's all part of that inventorying. We've been lucky about the stuff in the stacks. Oh, Jean, go ahead. Jean, sure. I think you have a, yeah. Um, so I had uh, two things. Um, this was amazing in terms of the design that went into this. So I am curious about how long it takes you to design um, these, uh, just because looking at the amount of uh, creativity and the amount of steps and all that, just amazing. Um, and then the second question is around cultural stuff. So um like some of these are very culturally specific like if you grew up with a magic school bus or you didn't grow up with a magic school bus so i'm curious about what you take into account in terms of that why don't we're gonna i have a demo that kind of shows you how we design some of the clues so i'm going to hold off on question one um but if i don't cover it all when we get to the powerpoint let me know we did actually when we first started we had a lot of discussions on the cultural stuff because we'll use a lot of pop culture and it's and we have a lot of international students so it became an issue of like you know, if we're referencing all these things that are, are more, you know, United States based, what, what our international students are going to do. But we found one, all our pop culture references don't work with American born students either sometimes. We, we had one, I think last two years ago, that was a movie star one. That was, it was magic themed and we had like Paul Giamatti and some other movie stars and no, whether they were international or not, nobody knew who they were. Um, but what helps basically is emphasizing Google and apps, because like for that one, for instance, they take a screenshot or they take a photo on their phone and do a reverse image search and they'll find it that way. Or with any of the music, because we'll do some, I think we've used older uh, music things before, they'll use Shazam and immediately get ID it that way. And also, again, usually the teams are mixed, so it's kind of nice because you'll have some international students with some um, you know, American students and they're working together. So usually they help each other out with the pop culture ones, but we definitely we try to, it, yeah. Oh, go ahead, John. But I was going to say re regarding that, the groups actually, we intentionally mix those groups up. So as the students come in the room, we're literally splitting up with the assumption that friends are walking in together you know, it's as they walk in, you're in group one, you're in group two, you're in group three, you're in group four, so that they can't gravitate towards the people that they normally interact with. And that seemed to mix things up just sort of naturally. 
we definitely make sure that when we do those, those um, anything that's like a cultural reference, we make sure that if you Googled it or described it in some way, like you can pull it, whether you know it right off the bat or not. We try our best. All right, why don't we talk about, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get to designing the game in just a second. We already talked about some of these already and described a little bit about what the in-person play is like. So the, there's a major scavenger hunt element in our in-person play and uh, the, the groups can easily speak with each other. So some of the challenges, I think we, we covered some of this already, but um, there's, I don't know if there was a solution to it, but there was kind of an opportunity. So again, we like the in-person because it actually gets the students out into the library and going to different floors and, and using the call number. We obviously can't do that in the Zoom version. The benefit with the Zoom though that we did find was that they can solve more clues. So often in an in-person, each group might only solve one or two clues and that's it. Whereas in the online, you usually solve a lot more, which means you have more time in the catalog and usually most groups make it to that article clue. So they get some experience in the database as well. Um, so those, that was kind of one thing that happened with it. Um, we lucked out with this year's theme being like a launch code because the other issue was how do we actually hide the clues that you need to find? So it worked out that we just figured out you could stick them in the catalog record. So each piece of the launch code just was able to go in there. And that was kind of our workaround for that. Um, the other issue we, we had too was Normally, all the clues are physical, and they're in a and they're in a box essentially. So there's a lot more spontaneity about what clue gets grabbed first, or what gets dragged out of the box, and what they're working on. So often, most of the groups are not working on the same clue at once. The issue with the Zoom, and and that's why I kind of mentioned doing the clues in whatever order, is that we found no matter what, students like to just start at the top and work their way down. So one of the things we have to actively do when we're doing one of these breakout rooms is make sure we're going into the rooms and figuring out who's solved what and who's working on what so that we can kind of encourage other rooms to work on certain clues to make sure that we try as best as, as we can to make sure that they solve it as a group by the end. <clears throat> so we're often trying to kind of make sure that everybody has solved each piece of the clue that they needed to. Um, the other thing that came up and I don't know how much we fixed this but in the original version of this of this Zoom iteration, we had everything separate. So like the clues were in a separate PDF, then there was the lib guide, then there was the mission report, there might've been something else as well. And we really tried to make it all in the lib guide except for that mission report, because what we found is students had a ton of tabs open and they get lost and they you know, forget where they were going and all that stuff. So one of the reasons we put the clues in the lib guide was to try to make sure everything was condensed and easy to find. Um, and I think the only other challenge we had was that issue that everybody has in Zoom, which is once you do a breakout room, you have no idea what's going on. So we kind of just intentionally let the students know that we're gonna pop in, that we're, you're gonna see a head just show up at some point and say hello. And we always make it a point if we haven't heard from somebody, if we're playing for 45 minutes, if we haven't heard from a group, we'll intentionally go in at the 15 minute mark to make sure um, sometimes they're doing great and sometimes there's total confusion going on. So we always intentionally like check in with them as well. Okay, so designing the escape room. and. We actually use pretty much the same steps, whether we're doing the in-person or the Zoom. So it you know, actually ends up being pretty much the same thing, except it's just a different platform. So what we typically do first is we, our very first step is to figure out what the student learning goals are gonna be. So what are, what's the main thing we want students to be able to do by the time they you know, are finished with this breakout activity or escape room? And kind of what was mentioned before, one of the big things to know is if you're doing an escape room, you just can't cover the same amount that you would be able to do in a one shot. Um, so you're not gonna be able to do a catalog, a database, and maybe something on RefWorks or citing or something like that. You do really lose a lot of time in the actual game and, and the roaming around the library. Um, so just be aware of that when you're thinking about what you want to cover and what learning goals, you're going to probably not be able to cover as much as you would in a traditional session. Um, but we always keep things in mind in terms of how, what, what 
types of techniques do we want them to use in the catalog? When we do the in-person version, what floors do we want them to visit? What collections do we want them to know about? Um, so we kind of think about that first when we get started. The second step we do is we come up with some type of story or scenario. Um, and we started with squirrels in the very first iteration. And then each subsequent iteration, we kind of throw in an extra theme. And we find uh, that the more specific you can get, the easier it is. Because if you go really broad, you have too much that you can kind of like research, you have too much that you can work with. So once you think of, you know, a squirrel in space, you'd be amazed at how much that limits to what you can actually find in the catalog and kind of what, what things you can get. So we always start, the second part is to actually think about what's the main theme that we're gonna go with overall. And now in terms of actually designing the clues, we do this in a couple of ways. So they seem really complicated, but it actually, it's, I think we've gotten used to how we design these and it's not as hard as I thought it would be. Um, so we do it a couple ways. So for example, with that Cape Canaveral one, that was the one that led you to hidden figures. So this was a good example of, we knew we want the students to go to the children's collection. We know we want them to find something in the children's collection that's related to STEM. So once we kind of looked in our catalog to find a book, we, we found hidden figures. So we basically built the clue around what we wanted them to find. So we got hidden figures. And then when we looked in the catalog record, we just browse to see what, what potential keywords might there be that would work to find this book. And we just tried them. And Christine Darden's name is the thing that came out as when you stick it in our catalog, it pretty much goes to that one book. And that's kind of then how we designed the clue. John, did you want to pop in or say anything? No, I was, I, I think the, the, the next one you're going to show is like the reverse of that, right? Where you yeah, say we want a certain kind, yeah. So this one, so that's how we did the Cape Canaveral one. But the one where, and I know not everyone got it because they were, they didn't have ProQuest Research Library, but this is a good example. So this clue led you to an article in ProQuest Research Library about kind of, I think the animals they sent in space by an author named Wit. And then there was a piece in that one that led you to a certain search term that got you to a book called, I think, Belka, Why Don't You Bark or Why Do You Bark? Um, and that's a really good example of, we had no clue what the students were gonna get to in the catalog at the end. We started at the beginning with just messing around in our in ProQuest Research Library, trying different terms and seeing what articles showed up if we tried different combinations of things. And I have absolutely no clue how we got to Gordo or Miss Baker, but somehow that in our conversation came up and we figured out that that pulled up that article and then we could teach students how to do an author search by using the, the author wit. And then what we did is once we got that article, we just looked through it to see, is there any search term in here that when we use it in the catalog, it pulls up a single record or only a couple of records. And that's how we got to the term Belka essentially. So, you know, I, I think I had been looking to see if they'd actually sent the squirrel into space. And so then we started searching that in ProQuest because we had been doing some general research on the theme. So that's kind of how we design the clues. And then we also, when we started off, we realized a libguide really helps because again, there's so much going on that having a single libguide where the students can go and they don't have to wander around the website as well, made it really easy. Um, so we choose to do a libguide. I, don't, I think our first iteration may or may not have had one. I don't think it did actually. So I don't think we always use the libguide, but we found that it comes really helpful. And then the last part of that step is beta testing. So the very first version we did, we did a lot of beta testing because we had zero clue whether um, it would even work in terms of the gameplay. Like, could you even do this in 45 minutes? What happens if both groups solve the same clue? Does it matter? So initially we did a lot of beta testing with both small and large groups. And now we're pretty confident in the gameplay. So we still do beta testing, but it's mainly to make sure that our, that our uh, clues are actual actually can be solved because we do always worry about like, what are the chances that we can actually solve? You know, we might be overthinking something. Um, so I can't stress enough the importance of beta testing. And keep it simple when you start. So I'll get, you know what, I'll stop sharing my screen and fully elaborate on that previous question about the uh, how elaborate it basically is. But I'm just gonna say for the Zoom version, 
we did that we designed it during quarantine so we had a lot of time on our hands so if you're so Jean, your question about the uh the detail <laughs> part of that stemmed from me having a lot of time at home <laughs> so it got way, it got way more elaborate um uh, just as an example, the very first iteration we did was like, I think Scribbler got squirrel mapped and you had to like solve the clues. That was way simpler. It was just like a file box. And I think it had a couple, it had like an email, it had like a RefWorks page that had one of the books you had to find. Um, I think it had some DVDs. We had a much simpler, easier clues. I think this version, one, we try to top ourselves each year. But also this was because of quarantine and we just, I was like building a serial spaceship in my apartment because I had the time. So we'll, we'll just go with that one. That, um, so that's kind of like a secondary uh, pandemic effect. You know, elaboration is comes from, <laughs> comes from that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is here, I've got, here's Nibbler. So like, this is ridiculous. I didn't build this. This is my boss who did this, who had a lot of spare time. So she created a whole space suit for this, for the squirrel. Right. We had my son do vid the video and promotional videos because he was, had come home to live during the pandemic. <laughs> so. so what I would say is you can keep it, we've made it much more elaborate than it has to be. I was even thinking you could keep it so simple that you have a single clue that students have to solve at the end of a library session to open one lock on a box and it that can be 10 minutes instead of a full library session or something like that so it doesn't have to be super complicated or over the top you can just start really simple i thought your clues were um well it is friday and it's late but i thought your clues were pretty tough so yeah, the other issue is we started with really easy clues and each iteration we start, <laughs> we st they're getting more complicated. So I, uh, it's one of the reasons we beta test to make sure students can actually solve them. Um, but we, when we're doing it with students, we usually pop in more and chat with them more and talk about keywords a little bit and give them a lot more guidance because they, they do need it. So any other questions? That's kind of the end for us, um, but we're happy to stay around and answer as many questions as you want about squirrels or escape rooms. I do have one other question, and it's, I guess this comes out of the, the place of being a boomer, right? So uh, whether you had to um, think about what the level of familiarity that the students would have with apps and so forth, or is that just, that is just so much a given that you didn't have to even think about that? That's a great question because the first time we used the audio clue, I had, I hadn't even, wasn't even aware of Shazam, you know, which reverses the music. And, and I thought, well, that, you know, that could be kind of tough. And immediately the kids, pulled out the students pulled out the, the app and I'm like oh well so much for that being difficult because you know <laughs> yeah we had one also and what's really amazing what it's, it's really fun because I think this past year we did eight scribblers but the year before that was more we had 16 and the way that they saw like in our heads we have a way that you would solve the clues usually students solve them and some of them solve it that way and then others like solve it in ways you would never even guess. So we had one in the first iteration that was a, an image clue and then it was connected to an email that had like certain keywords. So I was like, oh, they're gonna search the keywords and, that, and then they'll get the book. And the students like took an, it, um, I forgot how they did it. I think they took a picture of the image and then did a reverse image search and that pulled up a website that happened to be talking about the book and that's how they found the book. Um, and sometimes there are coincidental uh, things that they do when they do the search that pulls the thing right up. Remember that in the, I think it was the second iteration, somebody found some strange little Oh, they discovered we had put Nutter Butters in the first iteration as a red herring until somebody realized if you typed Nutter Butter, it actually led to one of the things that was a that was an actual right. solved <laughs> clue, a totally different clue. Right, I don't know. and that was unintentional completely. Other questions? How do you think, uh, do you think it brought students to using the library more, to 
to seeing the librarians as more, you know, approachable and so on? I think so. They usually have fun. I mean, the, the Zoom one, it was very hard. I will say the online version is very hard to gauge because, again, you're in breakout rooms and then people just disappear. Um, the in-person version, which we're going to go back to for the fall, um, I think so because they're usually, you know, they're usually having a good time. At some point, they hit the music clue and they start dancing. That's happened before. Um, or at one point they have one clue, the whole classroom has one clue left to solve and they all go out. Um, but I'll still get students who are like, oh yeah, I did that squirrel thing two years ago, or like they still remember the squirrel thing. So hopefully, I mean, we were also trying to solve the issue of we have seniors who are like, have no clue that we have a fourth floor or a third floor. Um, so when we heard that, we were like, all right, let's do clues so that at least at some point in their career at Skidmore, they are forced to go to the third or fourth floor. Um, so we've, for the most part, and the faculty have liked it too, because it, it usually is a really good team building exercise because we tend to do it earlier in the semester. So the students are still getting to know each other since their first years. Um, and it's, an, it's a kind of a weird, but fun way to, to get them to really meet some friends and get to know each other. And in person, we really play up the gameplay aspects. Like we said, we have the bell on the, on the table. We usually, the plan was to have the rocket with nibbler on the on the table we usually have a google clock ticking down so that there's a time pressure element to it and we'll make announcements you know there's only 10 minutes left there's only five minutes left so we're emphasizing that part of it and they usually uh enjoy that they get a kick out of the gameplay element of it and hopefully they um see us and our colleagues as accessible and approachable because, you know, rather than sort of a, a dry uh, traditional session, uh, they're getting an introduction that's intended to be fun. And I should, there's a couple, there's a good conversation going on in the chat. Um, and one of the things I should mention is our students often come back from multiple library sessions in other classes. And sometimes, I mean, I've seen the same student three or four times in different classes. So the other nice thing is, um, it's a very, it's so different. They're never gonna get it again. So often they're gonna come back for a more traditional one shot. So we're less worried about if this is the only library session they get, it's, it's not gonna cover as much as we would normally like, but we usually are pretty confident that they're coming back for a second or third session at some point. Um, and we also had a question about is the, is the library open or closed? It's open. Um, the students are pretty good. They're not, they're not making too much noise. Uh, we do, our third floor is our quiet floor. So we have intentionally tried to limit, you know, how many clues end up on the third floor. We usually try to limit it to maybe one so that they're not making too much noise. Um, but they're usually pretty good. They're not running too, too quickly. They're usually walking fast and, and yeah. A lot, you know, in the normal course of events, our library is Kind of a lively place anyway so it doesn't seem wildly out of place for them to be enthusiastic any other questions or is anyone else trying to design an escape room or debating about whether they're going to do one or have played with the idea and i'm not sure if you've already addressed this my apologies if this is a uh, repeat. Uh, Yvonne men mentioned a good point about uh, working closely with your uh, tech services since there's clues within an item's record. Uh, do you mind addressing that? Too? Oh, sure. Sorry, I missed that one, Yvonne. Yeah, so this year um, we just, we have a, we're a small group of librarians, so we just have one cataloger. So we did at the very beginning check with our cataloger, Adam, to make sure he was okay with you know, putting stuff in the local notes and um, if that if that was an okay and, and he was really easy to work with. And we actually are thinking of doing that for the in-person version. One of the reasons is when we play in person, um, when the students find something, they might find the wrong item. And in the past, we've let them just go and look for the wrong item because they're still using call numbers and, and stuff, but that does waste a lot of time. So this year, we actually really like the idea that they would be able to identify right off the bat whether they found the right item or not. So we might include, keep doing that in, in future iterations. 
I, I think also the the when we switched to bookmarks so they didn't have to haul the stuff down, I think that's something else we're probably going to go with so that there's less of that issue. Someone asked earlier about the, the shelving and that kind of stuff. If they just have to grab one bookmark, it makes it much easier in terms of have, making sure the stuff is there. And you could potentially use slugs as well. You wouldn't even necessarily have to have the item itself. Oh yeah, it looks like in the chat, we've got a bunch of people who have, have done some versions of escape rooms or are thinking about it. I will say we, we, we've only used the breakout EDU stuff for the physical locks and the little black lights and stuff like that. The, the actual site itself, we haven't really used at all. We took a quick look at it and then just sort of went and did our own thing. The other big tip we found, I was I'm trying to think of other things we've discovered. One of the biggest things too that helps with, you know, we're talking about confusion and if students aren't quite getting what's going on, usually if the faculty member preps them beforehand, because of, especially in our first version where we were still playing around with, you know, when the students were coming in and, and talking to faculty, we really now ask the faculty to let them know what to expect when they come in because they're much more game if they know it's an escape room and, and that they're gonna be like hunting down a squirrel or, so, or opening a box to save a squirrel. Um, usually then they've got, they're in the headspace where they know what's, what's about to happen. And then uh, you have a easier transition basically into the game. So we've made it a point of doing that and also trying to keep it in the early part of the semester. Cause when we found trying to do this later when we start to hit midterms, the charm of the squirrel goes way down He's not as charming when you're stressed and you've got a lot of workload and you and and you're trying to do a research project. So we really emphasize with the faculty to try to have them do Scribbler within the first six weeks and to let their students know. And we also try to encourage them to do a second, more traditional session as well if they do have research. So we get a lot of faculty who will do Scribbler first and then we'll do a regular one shot for the, whatever research project they have. Anything else? Any other questions? Well, thank you everyone for being, oh, sorry, was there one other question? No, I was just saying it was great fun. Thank you all for being willing participants too. I know it's a Friday afternoon after a long conference. So to, you know, send you into breakout rooms to start solving clues is, can be a lot to ask, especially after a, a long time. All right, thank you to our presenters. And um, as a reminder, this session uh, was recorded and uh, slides will be made available when the recordings go live on YouTube. Thank you everyone for joining our conference and making it a success. So have a great weekend. Thanks, Jocelyn. Thanks, Thanks for all your help with this. Thanks, Jocelyn. My pleasure. Bye, great seeing you.